Hi everybody, Levi Clay here, and today we are going to revisit a series that I've not actually posted a video on in quite a while, and that, of course, is Hero Worship. If you enjoy this video, please do leave me a comment below, and it's a massive help if you hit that subscribe button, hit the notifications, like the video, all of that good stuff. It really does help with the YouTube algorithm. Thank you very much. So today we are going to be talking about somebody that I'm surprised I haven't talked about sooner. Now I say haven't talked about, I'm talking purely in a hero worship sense. If you have followed my content for any period of time and you've listened to me talk about my favorite musicians, when it comes to rock and metal guitar players, there is only one person that I would ever consider putting in that top spot. And that, of course, is the incredible Michael Romeo. Now, you probably know Michael Romeo best for his work in the band Symphony X. And to be honest, that could be considered and it sounds ridiculous to say this, but that could be considered one of Michael's main flaws. Uh, it's not a flaw in the slightest, fantastic band. But when compared to a lot of the other guitar players that you think of in terms of fame, uh, fame and notoriety, the main reason they have so much fame and notoriety is they always go out under their own name. Michael Romeo has only released two solo albums, one in 94 and one in 2018. So uh, it's been a long time between those things. He's associated with a band. And I love and respect that, don't get me wrong. When you think of someone like Eddie Van Halen, he didn't release solo albums, but his band was still called Van Halen, which which kind of helped with that. I like guys that play in bands. I like uh, songs, and I like working with singers. And Michael has always tended to lead, lean towards that as a particular sound. So before I start talking about some of Michael's best moments, I'm going to suggest that you head on to the link in the description where there is a Spotify playlist that I have created of some of Michael's best playing over the course of his career. I think there's tracks from every single uh, studio album apart from the Dark Chapter which isn't on Spotify. So, let's talk a little bit about Michael Romeo. So, born on March 6th, 1968, Michael Romeo, as I say, best known for Symphony X. He has played with a few other bands, uh, most notably uh, Phantom, uh, Phantom's Opera, I believe the band's called. You can check out their stuff on YouTube. I have. It's a little bit cheesy and dated uh, and not really what the guy uh, is, is known for. But outside of that, prior to releasing his first album with Symphony X, the first record he put out was a solo album released initially in Japan in 1994 called The Dark Chapter. Now, when you talk about Michael Romeo and you listen to the music that he plays, it's very uh, clear that there's a lot of musical influences going on. Michael uh, has often talked about his love of bands like uh, Emerson, Lake and Palmer or or, uh, or Kansas, who have that very progressive edge to what they do. Now, of course, he's influenced by the more theatrical, over-the-top rock and roll stuff, bands like Kiss, but that progressive influence is very heavy on these early records. So the Dark Chapter is considerably more prog than it is metal. Uh, in fact, I, I think calling it metal in any way, shape or form would definitely be a bit of a push. Actually, I just want to go on a little tangent here. One of the things that is often levied at Michael Romeo is he's just a Malmsteen clone, and that couldn't be further from the truth. When you listen to Malmsteen, uh, the way he plays and his influences, there's a lot of Baroque influences in there. So you would... Uh... <laughs> Obviously, people call Malmsteen neoclassical. If you want to be a little bit more particular, you could probably call Malmsteen neo-baroque. When it comes to Romeo, his style is far more uh, modern in terms of the classical influences. He, he, he has all of these uh, kind of romantic influences, if you like, the romantic era of classical music. So if I was going to give him a title, uh, a genre title, it would probably be neo-romantic, which uh, is not a term that you hear very often associated with what I'm talking about. You think of the New Romantic period of the 80s. But you get where I'm coming from with this. In terms of defining his sound, comparing it to Malmsteen, they couldn't be any more different. Uh, the only similar, Literally the only similarity that they have is they play guitar, they have long brown hair, and they're both a little portly. But aside from that, they couldn't be any, any more different. So when you listen to that first album, The Dark Chapter, like I say, definitely very progressive. It's not my favorite. I've not listened to it in years, to be honest, because it's not my cup of tea. Uh, moving on, when the band formed Symphony X, because as I say, The Dark Chapter, instrumental album released in Japan, uh, there was label interest in him putting out more music, but they wanted him to be working with a singer. Totally understandable. So the self-titled Symphony X album was released in 1994. Again, this is one that I'm not actually a fan of, not listened to it in a very, very long time, years and years. 
Uh, and this is purely because the overall sound of the band changes so much over the years. But most notably, the change between the first album and the second album is so dramatic because the first album features a different singer. Every other album features uh, Russell Allen on vocals. The first album features uh, Rod Tyler on vocals. And I'm not crazy on his vocal style. And I think when you, a band changes a singer, it changes the sound of the band so dramatically. Uh, I always tend to think of them as different bands. So not crazy on that album. And I don't have any tracks on that in the uh Spotify playlist so maybe you want to go and check that one out maybe you love it but not for me uh very progressive worth pointing out okay moving on to what I would consider to be the real start of Symphony X 1995's The Damnation Game now The Damnation Game as I say Russell Allen is on vocals here and it's fascinating when you listen to this record because the change in style of Russell's vocals over the years is so unbelievably dramatic on this album he sounds um, theatrical would be the best way to describe it you can imagine him in a, in a candlelit room with a a, 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 a flowery the flowery is not the right word but you know a bit a big over the top flowing white shirt and being a glass of wine in hand and just being really o overly dramatic uh, that's that's a good image uh, when i think of this album it's a very um theatrical very medieval sounding uh, medieval distortion of course uh sounding album it's very very progressive there's a few heavier moments on it but of course as I say, these earlier albums are much more progressive than they are heavy. Now, you, that could, of course, be put down to production. That definitely plays a part in this, as the production changes and the ability to record heavy guitars slightly more effectively changes. The band definitely become heavier. Uh, when it comes to Damnation Game, though, if you just put on the uh, self-titled track, uh, Dam Damnation Game, uh, the intro on that is outrageous. Uh, Dress to Killers on this album. There's some great playing on the album. Uh, yeah, but not definitely not my favourite. So moving on to 1996, the band released The Divine Wings of Tragedy. Now, many fans consider this to be their opus. Um, their opus magnum? is that That's the phrase that I'm looking for, right? Uh, fans love this album. And of course, there are classic tracks on here like Of Sins and Shadows, um, Sea of Lies. Uh, I actually really like uh, uh, The Divine Wings of Tragedy, the 20-minute track. It's uh, just epic. The, 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 the choral start to that is just absolutely beautiful. This is an album that's definitely worth checking out and I think often fans would recommend this as the starting point for Symphony X. I don't know if it's the starting point that I would recommend because it's very, uh, it leans heavily on the progressive rock side of things rather than the more metal sound that they definitely become associated with later on in their career uh, but it is a great record and there's some absolutely outrageously cool playing on this and of course there's the classic Dark Chapter uh, is it the Young Guitar video, I'm sure it's called The Dark Chapter. Uh, there's some great videos of him playing some of the solos from this album, and it gives you a real good idea of how great a player uh, Michael really is. So you want to check that out, by all means do. Great record, but as I say, not my favourite. Moving on from there, 1998, you have the uh, Twilight and Olympus record. Now this is a kind of cool record. Uh, I think... I think Smoke and Mirrors, of course, is is going to be a track that Symphony X fans are always going to reference. There's an outrageously cool sweet picking part at the start of the tune. And then when the riff kicks in, it's fantastic. Great record. And as the name might suggest, and I've kind of not really addressed this, when it comes to uh, lyrical themes and overall vibes of Symphony X records, there's a lot of uh, kind of medieval themes. There's a lot of uh, Greek mythology themes. It's all very... Um, goblins, dungeons, that type of vibe. High fantasy, I think, would be another way that you might want to think of it, if you're just trying to pigeonhole it in your mind. And Twilight and Olympus is more of that. Again, not my favourite album, but there's definitely a few good tracks on this record, potentially worth checking out. And moving on, you have the new Mythology Suite. Now, this was released in 2000, and I think this is probably Symphony X's best collective album it's not my favorite uh but it's a it's a wonderful record to check out the production changes quite dramatically on this album and uh it's very heavy uh the the guitar the rhythm guitars are definitely very heavy on this album and uh wonderful wonderful record well worth checking out lots of orchestral stuff going on on this record too which if you're into if you're into the progressive sound uh, of blending the neoclassical influences with the heavy sound uh, this is a really wonderful place to do a lot of that uh vocal is fantastic on this album and the guitar playing is absolutely freaking outrageous uh yeah I, to me when i think of the new mythology suite it's kind of like thinking of dream theaters uh, metropolis part two scenes from a memory obviously it's the best album when because <laughs> it's fantastic uh but you have to think about other ones it's it really is a, a wonderfully perfect album uh, a lot of uh, quotes of classical themes on there 
Worth checking out, really do enjoy it. But then we get onto the most important one for me, and that's 2002's album, The Odyssey. So The Odyssey was the first Symphony X album I picked up when it came out, uh, back in, as I say, 2002. Now this album really opens up the heavier side of Symphony X. They explored it quite a bit on the New Mythology Suite and The Odyssey, they really break down into the heavier side of their sound. Uh, you, tracks like Wicked, are uh, there's groove to, to a track like that. And while there are long progressive moments on the record, of course, the self-titled track, The Odyssey, uh, the titular track, The Odyssey, is a long telling of uh, Homer's Odyssey tale, uh, Odysseus and his travels uh, from and to Ithaca. A wonderful track, tells a beautiful story and there's some awesome musical themes in there. But yeah, this is definitely a heavy, he really heavy album. And I think that this kind of bounces in with being my favourite album and maybe my favourite because it's nostalgic. Uh, but for me, I would probably recommend this as a starting point for most people because it maintains a lot of the progressive elements that Michael is best known for whilst being heavy. There's definitely a lot of heaviness to this album. Uh, from there, 2007, the band released Paradise Lost. Now, Paradise Lost just continues that. They were clearly getting a lot of success from the heavier sound. Paradise Lost is a heavy album. Uh, there are definitely a lot of progressive elements to the album, but the heaviness of this album is dialed up. And the real change, I think, on this album is when you listen to Russell Allen's vocals, his vocal delivery changed quite a lot around this period. Up until this point, almost everything he did could be described as singing, whereas on Paradise Lost, don't get me wrong, he's still singing, of course, but there's a lot more growl in his voice there's a lot he's he's more comfortable uh, delving into a little bit of a little bit of fry in his voice that uh, you could i don't want to say shouting but let's say aggression he he puts a lot more aggression in his voice on that record uh, and again i think that helps to change the sound of the band and shift them towards this heavier sound uh, 2011's iconoclast this is the one that i tend to lean on and say this is my favorite and it's interesting, actually, because when we talk about the themes of Symphony X's music, as I say, a lot of Symphony X's music is very high fantasy, uh, Dungeons and Dragons style, if you like, and that's not my favourite vibe. Iconoclast kind of changes that. Don't get me wrong, it's not rooted in reality, but it becomes a lot more sci-fi in, uh, in nature. And I like that. I really like this kind of um, the imagery of of blending man and machine type thing. Uh, I think it's a wonderfully heavy album. There's some incredible playing on here. I've transcribed a bunch of riffs from this. Uh, check out my YouTube channel, of course. I've, uh, there's a transcription of uh, the Dehumanized solo I'm sure I have on uh, here on YouTube. Uh, just outrageously cool record. And yeah, I come back to this one time and time again. Then we get to the last Symphony X album that has been released to date, and that's 2015's Underworld. A great record, delving back into the themes of, you know, Greek mythology, the underworld, uh, <laughs> the sales of Charon is on there. It's, it's definitely uh, a return to form in terms of theme. Playing is outrageously good on this track, on this album. I took a lot of influence from this when I was recording my uh, my album, Out of the Ashes. There's some licks in there, like the Kiss of Fire tapping lick, which I just outright stole, adapted it and stole. <laughs> uh, very, very cool album. And again, like I say, heavy, just heavy. And for me, as I say, that's the real interesting thing about when you listen to Romeo's playing. There's just this evolution in his writing style as he leans more and more into the heavy. So uh, I just want to, before I talk his last solo solo album, yeah, War, uh, War of the Worlds Part 1, um, when you look at the Symphony X album, there's there's short periods between each of these. So uh, Symphony X to Damnation Game was a year. Damnation Game to Divine Wings was a year. Then we had two years to Twilight, two years to V, uh, two years to Odyssey. Uh, getting a little bit longer, adding a few more years to Paradise Lost, a few more years on Iconoclast, uh, four years between Iconoclast and Underworld. We are now in a position where it's been six years since the last Symphony X album. They are slowing down in terms of their output, and this is devastating to me. So, guys, if you could pull your finger out and get another album out, that would be fantastic. So, I just, uh, you know, talking music, I just want to lastly mention Michael's solo album, uh, latest solo album, War of the Worlds Part 1. I was super, super hyped when this was announced, and it came out, and I just wasn't, it, it didn't do what I wanted in the slightest. 
I honestly feel that when you listen to this album, it just sounds like Michael Romeo want, wanted to make a Symphony X album and he didn't want Russell Allen to sing on it. When Michael Romeo is releasing a solo album, I want instrumental stuff, which is crazy because, as I say, I am very, very into the uh, the band side of things. But he has a band, so I'm not interested in him releasing more music that's essentially the band but with a different singer, because I love the singer in Symphony X. I love Russell Allen's voice. So not crazy on a lot of War of the Worlds. It does delve into a little bit more of those sci-fi themes, definitely kind of iconoclast uh, Symphony X sound on there, which of course, love, but no Russell Allen, so no thank you. Definitely disappointed by that album. Uh, I listened to it a few times when it came out. There's a few great moments on it, don't get me wrong, but uh, it's not something I've really gone back. I've not listened to it since 2018, to be honest with you, and I have no real urge to, whereas... Almost every other Symphony X album I've listened to in the last two months. So, uh, yeah, that should give you everything you need to know on that one. <laughs> so let's talk about Michael's playing style. As I mentioned earlier, the neo-romantic thing, his vocabulary is wide-ranging. He uses a lot of interesting scale sounds. You're going to hear lots of uh, diminished vocabulary in there. You're going to hear lots of whole tone vocabulary in there. He has outrageously good uh, left-hand stamina. So his legato playing is really kind of off the wall. But just in terms of his, uh, you know, the riffs that he's likely to play, if you look at the song Nevermore from, from Underworld, if you try learning the, the chorus riff to that, the, what he's actually playing in that, it's an outrageous workout on the left hand and I don't know what he was thinking. Much admiration to him, but I don't know what he was thinking because that, for me, would be a terrifying thing to have to get up and play every night. But of course, his hand stamina is so damn good. I'm sure he's not breaking a sweat when he plays a tune like that. Uh, so yeah, lots of really over-the-top left-hand stuff. He's a great alternate picker. Uh, he's obviously very well known for his tapping technique. He's a very well-rounded player when it comes to rock vocabulary. He's kind of got it all great sweet picking uh, vocabulary. And another thing that's kind of worth pointing out, uh, he's really good with a whammy bar as well. He's very, very good with a whammy bar. He ha definitely has a few cliche licks that you do hear time and time again that he plays with the whammy bar. Uh, but cliche doesn't feel like the right word. It's more trademarks. He's got trademark things that he likes to do with the whammy bar. And that, of course, is fine by me. Uh, you know, I won't steal them, Michael, because they are your licks and it would be very obvious to me, at least, if I played them, that's a Michael Romeo lick. Uh, yeah, so just wonderful player. And as I say, do check out that Spotify playlist. You are going to find things on there that you enjoy. Let's just lastly talk about his gear. So uh, Michael has, since 2005, been playing Caparison guitars. He has a signature Caparison. It's a wonderful guitar. I had one for a, a decent period of time, and I really, really regret selling that. I sold it to get another Mayonnaise guitar because I wanted more Mayonnaise guitars. Uh, but I, yeah, that Caparison was a wonderful guitar. Wonderful, wonderful guitar. And uh, yeah, if you're into modern rock guitars you can't go wrong with that guitar wonderful guitar prior to that he was playing the esp m2 deluxe uh, you've probably seen a lot of footage of him playing that from back in the day and of course on that young guitar video he was playing one of those esps uh cool guitars but really in the grand scheme of things michael's never really been about pushing his guitar gear you know what i mean like compared to a lot of great players there's not really any instructional material with uh, with Michael, aside from the Young Guitar video. Uh, he's never been about, check out my guitar playing. It's always been about, I'm in a band, go and check out my band. No, I don't want to talk about this lick that I'm playing here, or how I'm doing this, or why I'm doing that, etc., etc. It's It's always, I'm in a band, listen to my band. And I can't think of a better way to close this than to say that. Michael Romeo is in a band. They're a fantastic band. Easily, easily one of my favourite bands of all time. Please go and check out that link on Spotify below. Check out the playlist, add it, follow it, uh, and have a listen to some of these tracks because just an outrageously great guitar player uh, and would probably be a bigger influence on me if I had half of the ability that he had uh, has. I can't play like Michael Romeo. I've definitely got videos where I teach you some of the concepts that Michael does. But I can't play like he, he does because he's just so high level. Um, and hopefully, if you're unfamiliar with him, maybe I've convinced you to go and check out some of his stuff because wonderful player. If you do go and check him out, please do let me know in that comment section below. Finally, I know that was a lot of talking, right? Finally, I just want to say a huge thank you to my wonderful supporters over on Patreon. Couldn't do these videos without you guys. So thank you for your love, kindness, and support. If you would like to check me out on Patreon, link is in the description where you can get access to my Facebook group and get mentioned in the credits, get access to private streams. You can have private lessons with me because, of course, I am a teacher. 
Many people forget this. If you want lessons, hit me up. And if that doesn't suit, you can also head on over to Amazon and check out one of my books. Of course, my latest book, Hybrid Picking Guitar Technique, has just dropped. And if you want to go and grab yourself a copy of that, that would be very much appreciated. Thanks so much for your love, kindness, and support, guys. As always, leave a comment, subscribe, all of that good stuff. It all helps the channel out. If you have any questions about this or anything else, please do let me know in that comment section below. And I will see you for another video soon. Goodbye.